Okay, just a second. Well, good morning, everyone. Thanks for uh, sticking around uh, for this last day. It's been a long week, at least for me, but a very nice week, actually. So um, I want to thank everyone for being here. This is actually a very important session because um, we need to <coughs> do some planning for uh, what I think we can call Cordex 2. Uh, <clears throat> so hopefully we can make, if not some decisions, at least some sort of agreement of some key issues that need to be discussed. Um, so the way the discussion is going to go, okay, the goal of this session, again, is possibly to agree on basically what we need to, to do for Cordex 2. Uh, there will be, first, uh, Bill will actually... Um, uh, lead a uh, brief discussion on the scientific challenges. As you know, we identified last year in the SAT, in the SAT meeting in North Shopping, a set of five challenges. Uh, there are some white papers being uh, developed. Uh, so we'd like to get some uh, feedback as to whether these are the right ones or whether they should be updated or something is missing or so, or so on. Uh, then uh, Eric will... Um, briefly review the issue of the FPS, the flagship studies. Now this concept is already an integral part of Cortex, so we, need, we don't need to go through that again, but uh, we will announce again um, what uh, studies have been approved. Perhaps this was not entirely clear from uh, Bill's uh, talk uh, <coughs> on Tuesday, since he went through it uh, quite uh, very quickly. And also, <clears throat> I heard some, we heard some questions about the procedure of how these FPS are developed and approved, so maybe we'll go uh, through that once, uh, once again. And then I think this is the, main, the most important item. We will discuss what we are calling the Common Regional Experiment or Core Framework, which will be the, the heart of the Cordex 2 phase. Uh, hopefully we can come with some agreements on uh, how we should go about that. So I'm going to very briefly just have two slides. There is some input that we need to consider in, uh, in the discussion that we have this morning. Uh, some input, first of all, from WCRP uh, that we had from uh, Dave Carlson and uh, the last JSC meeting. Um, first of all, as, as Dave mentioned, WCRP is kind of uh, uh, revisiting some of its structure. And actually, the positioning of Cordex is still not well defined. Uh, up until last year, Cordex was a project under the uh, um, sort of the, not supervision, but under the, I don't know, framework I wrote here of the WGRC, so the Working Group on Regional Climate. Uh, it's unclear whether the structure will remain. Right now, Cordex is listed as a core project in the WCRP website, so at the same level as uh, Cliver, GVEX, uh, Click, and Spark. Uh, whether it will be still a core project or not uh, is still unclear, right, Bill? I just think this is still being considered. There are some advantages in being a core project because this is a very, these are very you know, important, long-lasting projects within WCRP, but of course there are also some responsibilities. Uh, so this discussion is, uh, is still going on. Uh, one thing that Dave mentioned is that uh, we should, uh, <coughs> Cordex should uh, integrate a little bit uh, more within the WCRP programs, in particular within the framework of the WCRP Grand Challenges. Now, just in case uh, somebody does not know exactly what these Grand Challenges are, I've listed them here. Uh, so there's one on clouds, circulations, and climate sensitivity. Actually, the titles keep changing every year, so these are the latest titles. Uh, so essentially, this is the role of clouds in the climate system. Uh, melting ice and global consequences. It used to be called uh, climate change in the cry cryosphere. But anyways, that's, that's what it is. Extremes, uh, regional sea level change, and water uh, availability. Uh, you might have noticed that the regional Grand Challenge has uh, disappeared. There used to be a uh, regional Grand Challenge, Regional Information Grand Challenge, for a number of reasons that is too long to discuss now. 
this has sort of disappeared and regional activities within uh, WCRP are being uh, discussed now. So Cortex mostly was expected to contribute to the regional grand challenge, and now that it's not there anymore, uh, of course you can see that there is potential for contribution to many of these uh, challenges, if not all of them. Um, but we should make an effort to sort of uh, try to uh, have a stronger connection with these activities. Another thing to mention are some new emphasis. One is this FOSI initiative. Now, I don't know too much about this. Uh, I don't know if uh, Bruce is still around. Maybe he can say a few words uh, at some point about this uh, FOSI uh, program. You can even do it now if you want. Uh, just very briefly, if, can, can you get the microphone? Can uh, Bruce? Because I think it's, uh, these are important initiatives, especially for the flagship studies that can contribute to these, uh, to these projects. So the FOCI initiatives, FOCI stands for Frontiers of Climate Information. Um, and it's predicated on the idea that we are looking at information for regions, not regional information. Regional information implying higher resolution, downscaling, etc. That being a component of a package which is information for regions. And in that idea under the FOCAR, card would be in integrating against uh, targeted application use case scenarios um, and drawing information from the global climate models, observation <coughs> sets, downscaling of different forms, other sources of information. Um, and doing an integrated holistic approach to a use case scenario from the physical climate sciences perspective. The um, proposal has been well accepted by the WCRP JSC, um, but now we need to wait for the WGRC's um, restructuring to go through to find a, pr a proper home for this. Anyways, these are, again, sort of uh, flagship studies for WCRP more than for... Uh, or Cordex. Something we just learned on Tuesday, at least I learned on Tuesday, is that now that... Oh, there is a... Yeah. Yes, uh, Boram Lee from WCLP. Uh, just, uh, add, just to elaborate this part, uh, for information, the last JSC the grand challenge on water availability that was presented with a new uh, revised concept and that is actually there in the, in the new emphasis on the food baskets regions. So uh, the newly uh, framed grand challenge is the, on water, on the food baskets in the world uh, and with the primary emphasis on central U.S and uh, the Pannonian Basin in Europe and Southeast Asia. And also, just uh, as uh, Bruce said, uh, the uh, FOCA initiative, uh, the concept was uh, well received uh, at the JSC. Uh, the, uh, now the, the latest issue is we want to have um, a little more uh, embracing and integrated the framework to support the regional activities. And the uh, FOCAI concept being uh, at the forefront of uh, this uh, sort of integrated initiative. And uh, in that line, the, uh, the demonstration uh, place uh, primarily is, uh, is noticed for the uh, coastal cities. And that is also in line with the GC on, the, on sea level and the extremes and uh, also the other, other regional aspects of other GCs. Okay, great. So anyways, uh, so uh, thanks Boram. She went already through these points. Just a reminder about this food uh, basket regions, which is sort of a, a new concept. And this can be actually quite useful maybe to uh, uh, focalize some of future uh, flagship studies. The other thing to take into account in the discussion is the input we received from IPCC. This has actually been a very strong input on different occasions. Uh, uh, in general, uh, in, in, in more than one case, uh, one feedback was that uh, in the last IPCC report, Cordex was really not extremely uh, present or prominent, except for a 
some regional chapters in Working Group 2, most noticeably the European chapter. So there was a general call for a, a better presence of Cordex in the, or contribution in the IPCC reports. There was a, I don't know how many of you were in this uh, Brazil workshop last year, but there was a lot of discussion there. Um, again, that Cordex should contribute more. Uh, in that point, uh, sort of the, there was this call for some sort of uh, pan-regional product uh, based on Cordex information, not, not uh, was discussion about the Atlas, so we call it the Atlas-like product, so some sort of product that could be used uh, for working group two and for VIA activities, essentially. Uh, something also that we learned on uh, Tuesday was that uh, now there is a greater emphasis on the low-end scenarios. Um, so much for the RCP 8.5, I guess. <laughs> um, I mean, that's still there, it's still an important one, but for some reason there is a perception that we are going on a lower emission pathway. I don't know where this optimism is coming from, but uh, uh, there seems to be. So now we probably should try to concentrate a bit more on the low-end emission scenarios. And then there is this issue of the 1.5 degree global warming special report. There was a meeting in Brussels uh, some months ago where there was a strong uh, sort of request that Cordex should contribute to this, uh, to this report, especially from the EU, I would add. Uh, so, um, uh, this, of course, this report is happening in, Mar in uh, September 2018, so we heard that uh, the deadline for accepted papers, if I remember correctly, was March 2018, so there is really not, not uh, much time. So we have strong sort of requests from both WCRP and IPCC that I think can shape our Cordex 2 activities. So um, hopefully you can keep this in mind for the discussions. So I'm going to leave here the general introduction. And as I said, um, let's revisit, first of all, our scientific ch challenges with uh, Bill and then the FPS with uh, uh, Eric, then we have the coffee break, and then we have plenty of time to discuss the core, the core framework. Okay, thank you, Filippo. Okay, so as Filippo said, um, one of the things that we uh, did at our science advisory team or SAP meeting uh, a little over a year ago in North Shopping was to review our uh, scientific mission um, and develop, start developing a set of challenges that we wanted, to, that we felt uh, gave a framework to what we're trying to do scientifically in Cordex. And so just to remind you a little bit, I showed this slide, I didn't dwell on it though on Monday, on Tuesday. Um, we have this mission statement about advancing and coordinating the science and application of regional climate downscaling through global partnerships. And underneath that, we identify this set of uh, four goals, some of which are focused on the, the scientific mission of better understanding uh, of relevant regional, local climate phenomena, their variability and changes through downscaling, and also to evaluate and improve regional climate downscaling models and techniques, and that refers to both dynamical and statistical downscaling, and I suppose eventually that might even include high-resolution global simulations. Uh, and then looking beyond just the scientific uh, aspects of this to produce coordinated sets of regional downscaled projections worldwide and to foster communication and knowledge exchange with users of regional climate information. So then on that basis with these goals in mind, we then set up some scientific challenges that we, we felt gave a, a structure to what we think uh, we should be trying to do within Cordex and to guide efforts around the world. And that is, on this next slide here, these different categories. Uh, first one involving added value, uh, the added value of downscaling with, with some sub-issues here, which we can get into a, a little bit later. Um, uh, another category involving the human element, uh, getting into various types of human activities that affect regional climate beyond just the large-scale changes in greenhouse gases. Um, 
coordination of regional coupled modeling, recognizing that there are all sorts of different types of coupled modeling that are, that are, have, are models that are being developed uh, and trying to provide some framework of uh, how to approach that. And then recognizing some, some key regional aspects that um, it seems like a regional simulation, regional downscaling is, could do, uh, be especially important for. So issues related to precipitation uh, and then also local wind systems that would get much better resolved uh, in, in a downscaling process. So we have these five different categories here right now. And the first thing that I would want to just raise as a question, it would be, are there other categories that we should have that, that maybe some other issues that don't fit into these categories that we should be thinking about um, as part of our uh, framework of scientific challenges? And I would invite anybody who has any suggestions to uh, just raise your hand, speak up, uh, or maybe you think these are all we need to have. So make sure, think about it for a moment. Um, and uh, if you have some other thoughts, some other things that need to be included, this is the time to discuss this. Okay, right there. Thank you very much. Well, I'm Michael from Nigeria. We discussed yesterday that most of the research findings have been published, difficulty of uh, the findings being implemented. So I think uh, we can put some of the challenges, scientific challenges, implementation of the findings from the research work. How can we enforce the policy makers? Then what can we do so that all the research findings will be useful for humanities? I think that is also part of the scientific challenges. Okay, uh, I'm not make sure I understood this. So you're talking about how, how do we interact with policy makers? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that actually gets into Okay, so the, the point that was being made um, was um, should there be some aspect of this that involves interacting with policymakers? That touches in on a, a broader question which the, the Cortex sat is still wrestling with, which is just what are the boundaries of Cortex? Where does Cort how far does Cortex go as a scientific program? How far do we go into that realm of, of interacting with policymakers, uh, developing climate information, this whole distillation process that Bruce was talking about. Um, you know, if you look at our, our, our uh, goals here, we do talk about fostering communication and knowledge exchange with users of regional climate information. But something that we haven't really resolved in our discussions is um, just how far down that pathway do we, do we go? Where are the boundaries of what Cortex is as opposed to where some other program maybe takes over the output that we're producing, the analyses we produce, and turns that into the types of information that policymakers want to work with. So it's an important point to bring up. And we should maybe think of it as possibly a scientific challenge or some kind of a challenge here. It's still a little fuzzy, at least in my mind, in terms of where we go uh, with all of that. And in part because my concern at one point was that Cortex was trying to start to do too much of everything. And I was afraid we would get very diffuse and, uh, and ill-defined. So. It's an element that we need to be aware of. It's part of our goals, and I certainly invite other people to comment on that or other issues that they want to bring up. I think. I, I would like to propose some coordination between uh, modeling on over um, complex terrain, for example, like Andes or something. Okay, so it's perhaps implicit in some of this but maybe something more explicit that deals especially with, with complex terrain, which, yes, I would agree, that should be an area where downscaling should have some strengths because we're resolving uh, important topographic features. Hey, I was wondering if there's a strategy to, on uh, how Cortex could follow best CMIP 6. CMIP 6 provides a, a whole lot of different MIPs focusing on different aspects of the climate system, different processes, not only new scenarios. And um, so I was, was wondering, is there a strategy on uh, what to focus on and how to make use, for example, of um, land use scenarios and um, other variants? Yeah, okay, land use scenarios. Um, yeah, and that's not explicitly in here either, other than it, it is tied in with this, this human element, but um, it, we do have land use change there, but but that's as far as it goes. Sorry. But you're proposing something beyond that, if I understood you correctly. You're wondering about 
If we should have some structure that's similar to what CMIP 6 has with different MIPs within it, maybe cross comparisons across regions, something like that. Yeah. Um, that's a higher level of organization. Um, I mean, I think it would be interesting and useful, and maybe the way to approach that might be we might think about uh, workshops, conferences on specific aspects of these along the way. Um, uh, I'm not disagreeing with your concept. It's just that I start to get a little concerned about getting to be too big and too bulky. But it might be a way, actually, if we set up some, maybe some task force, forces, task forces, working groups that may be focused on some of these particular areas, and it actually could be a way of engaging more people in the community. I mean, the science advisory team is, uh, we're about, what, eight to ten people, um, and obviously the community is far, far larger than that, and, and it'd be a way of engaging more people uh, in what goes on. We also have points of contact in the regions, which are more than just the science advisory team, but again, maybe something that, that engages more people um, in some kind of structured way, which might feed into what you're talking about. So it may not necessarily be uh, an added category of scientific challenge, but maybe how we approach uh, integrating these and coordinating them across regions. And that might be a useful thing for us to think about, especially because it gets more people engaged in, in the whole process. One of the overarching goals in all this, and it's why we're talking here today, is we want to try to make sure this is as transparent as possible and that members of the community really have input and that it's not just this group of 10 people who are selected for whatever reason, you know, making all the decisions. So, so maybe that's a way of carrying forward with that. Hi. Um, maybe also uh, I, we're, we're not getting you in the microphone. Could, uh, hello? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, another aspect is to couple up with hydrologists and also biologists uh, and other types of sort of impact sciences, which are, uh, they're not really explicitly mentioned here, mm -hmm. uh, but I think if, if it, to make it more explicit, it will, that is also uh, something that we should look into. Uh, yeah, no, that, that's a good point. Um, yeah, it's sort of implicit in different parts of this, especially the human element part. Um, but another way that that's especially relevant is, is Dave Carlson, the, the head of the WCRP, emphasized uh, earlier this week to us that uh, anytime you connect up with other uh, WCRP core projects, um, that's really good because then there's a lot of, a lot of uh, coming together of different uh, areas of activity, a lot of synthesis that can go on. Um, so GWEX is an obvious connection, Clivar would be another, but especially GWEX with their, their hydroclimatology uh, um, programs. Um, yeah, uh, if, if, if Filippo wants to comment. It's on here, okay, yeah. I wanted to comment on this point. Uh, I think Cordex itself should not deal with impacts. So I would be a little careful about mentioning impacts because then it will really, I mean, the, the VIA part that utilizes in principle or hopefully the Cordex information is a whole other area that I don't think, I personally don't think we should too much get involved in because then it will become really too, uh, too broad. So. Uh, I recognize your point, but I wouldn't make impacts an explicit component of Cordex because otherwise we'll get into a whole different ball game. It would just my okay. But but maybe you might say we want to be in, the VIA interface, aware, yeah, something in terms like this, of but, uh, not that we do impacts. Otherwise, uh, I think it becomes really too much. Yeah. But in terms of the data sets we produce, um, the types of simulations people do, um, and then maybe also trying to foster ties. And again, that might be, if, if we think about this possibility of some sort of working groups, they might even be, that might be part of their charge is to foster those connections with people that you might say are, in some sense, are outside of Cordex. Here. Um, I also wanted to em emphasize mountain regions, <laughs> once again, especially water in mountain regions. Like, for example, if you think about snowpack, I think this could fit under precipitation. 
um, which is a very promising area for regional climate models. And another thing is local feedback processes, like snow albedo feedback mm -hmm. or soil moisture uh, precipitation feedback, for example. This could fit in there as well. Okay. Yeah, we do have the word cryosphere here, but, um, but you know, again, this may be a way that, that if we have some groups that are focused on filling out what these, these areas mean, it could cover a lot of those extra details. And, and with this whole notion of complex topography, it obviously fits in with that, although there's obviously issues of snow and albedo that don't necessarily involve complex topography. You know, a number of these things also obviously are not, they're not all independent from each other, but they, they do uh, dovetail in many ways. Did you want to say something, yeah, Felipe? Just, uh... yeah. Okay. Um, I think the mountains is really a good idea for, uh, for, the for adding the challenge uh, because this is actually could be a, one of the foci mm -hmm. uh, that might be useful to highlight. Concerning the feedbacks, uh, I think these are sort of implicit in many of these. So I'm, I mean, the regional feedbacks is what every, I mean, what we're supposed to do. So I wouldn't, uh, I mean, I think it would be difficult to actually have like a challenge on something that is, could be snow, could be whatever. Uh, so it could be something to highlight in the different challenges, but maybe it's a topic that is a bit too broad to, to have a bullet there. Uh, but for the mountains, actually, I think uh, now it would be very nice to have a, uh, some more focused efforts because this is where we can really make the difference, actually. Yeah. To, yeah. To, to comment on, on this list, uh, first the separation between the human element and the uh, corporal modeling. I think sometimes this could create some, some issues in, in the organization. For example, this week in the conference, we have the aerosols issue in both sessions, whereas probably they could be together, the natural aerosols and the anthropogenic aerosols. So I don't know if this separation is a good one or, or not. Also because most of the people who are doing uh, regional climate uh, system modeling are willing to go to regional earth system modeling that includes the human influence. So I, I don't think if this separation is good. And the second point, I think that coordination of regional couple modeling is something very important within Cortex, but this is not a scientific challenge. This is a challenge in coordination. And then uh, we had a side event yesterday on this, uh, for this community. And one of the points uh, coming out was the fact that we have many challenges in the different area. And the couple system, the regional couple system, are there to, as tools, as tools to answer those challenges. So coordination of couple model is not a scientific challenge. It's, uh, it's coordination of tools that could help to answer challenge in precipitation, in local wind system, <coughs> in snow, in, and so on. Yeah. So Indeed. we have to, to think about the the phrasing of the Maybe I, I can explain why there is the word coordination there, because I remember this discussion. Uh, the issue is that when we, okay, we think that the couple modeling is definitely an area that RCMs and whatever else is, is direction that is going, so they should deserve some specific mention. But this is going on anyways. So we thought, I mean, people are developing couple models anyway, so that's why we have the word coordination. Say again? Under the coordination challenges, but not under the scientific challenges. Well, ah. okay. We could, we could change the word coordination. We could just say regional couple modeling uh, and feedbacks or something like that. <laughs> it's a modeling challenge. Yeah, I okay, think it's a modeling challenge. Part, part of the point of that category is just to identify that there are various ways of, of, of other processes that, that need to be coupled in other types of modeling. Um, if you've got better suggestion for the wording, please give it to us. But, but the, hope, the no, notion no, was but to let pull me, together. I, I actually think it is a scientific challenge. It's like uh, convection permitting modeling, which now is not mentioned, but it's implicit in added value. That is a scientific challenge. I mean, modeling is a scientific challenge, I think. Scientific challenge is not just the study of a process or whatever. It also, modeling is a challenge. So developing coupled models is a scientific challenge within Cordex, I think. Now, I agree with the first 
comment you had. The human element, it's a bit, uh, because many things of human element also go into the aerosols and so on. So we could rename that land use, also to take uh, somebody else had a point. If you look at all the points inside, it's all sort of about land use. So we could have something to do with land use. I think part of what we were recognizing was that in contrast to looking at something like land use change, that the part of what's going on here is there are, are big modeling challenges in terms of trying to get these, these yeah, different parts yeah, to function it's a scientific together. scientific challenge, I think. Um, in, in, a, in, a, in a worthwhile way. But we can argue about this some more over coffee or whatever. That's fine. Just to flow on what uh, Samuel said, I had problems, in fact, uh, treating your, uh, the items here because I, they, they are not at the same level. And for, well, I had also a problem with coordination of regional couple modeling. Uh, especially if you say that uh, behind high added value, we must think about high resolution and so on. So, I think there should be, I agree with you that modeling is also a scientific activity, but m maybe we should have one dedicated uh, action on developing modeling tools, which can uh, include high res uh, uh, coupled, but also uh, statistical downscaling. So through the added value of, uh, we could put uh, what uh, uh, modeling tools would develop. I understand human element, but then I agree that mountains, well, behind mountains we have precipitation, local wind system and so on, but we have also coastal areas. So maybe uh, instead of just pointing on this uh, precipitation subject that falls from the sky, we may uh, focus where we add value, so in complex regions. So maybe have a more regional focus, meaning um, uh, so. Uh, uh, high mountains, maybe coastal areas. Uh, um, I don't know, with the land use also, you can have very strong uh, effects where you have very uh, large uh, surface heterogeneities. Urban areas, that's where we are expected, I would say. Uh, precipitation is just what we will, the, the, the effect we will, uh, we will look at. But, uh, Okay, that's, yeah. that's my okay. comment. Um, yeah, what, what I didn't put on this slide, actually, maybe I should have, was we did identify some cross-cutting themes, which I think are a little bit along the lines of what you're saying, but um, if I understood you correctly, you're suggesting that we, there, there's particular landscapes that, that pull a lot of this together in certain ways, but also start to really pull out the processes that are involved in, in actually de generating added value from downscaling, and it might be, um, another way of organizing our thinking. Um, yeah, I, 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 that, that's, that's an interesting thought because it it's kind of pulls them all together in terms of addressing issues of added value, but it still keeps all these other challenges uh, in place. I could, I could sort of see that maybe that, that might be another cross cut to this. Um, uh, that might be another way of, of thinking about how this is organized. Yeah, and again, I want to emphasize that we did not view these as all being mutually exclusive from each other and that there are a lot of overlaps, but maybe there's some types of overlaps like certain regional areas like complex terrain, coastal areas, um, landscapes that have rapidly varying land use uh, or those breadbasket regions that, that pr present different types uh, of issues that combine elements of these, but uh, talk about sort of their, their organization in a, in a structured way that actually doesn't separate them out into these different categories, but recognizes they're part of a system, a regional system. That's a good, that's a good thing to think about, I think. So maybe I can come in now and uh, give a little bit of my view and maybe uh, give some comments to the coordination of the regional coupled modeling. So first of all, um, I would like to say it is of very important that we today also discuss how far is Cordex going. Um, that was an earlier discussion which is not necessarily directly related to the scientific challenge, but maybe. Second, I think the connection to the MIPS, to the, uh, um, to the CMIP 6 and all the MIPS uh, is partly being organized and will be organized in the future also along scientific topics not only in an extra task, because some of the scientific topics which we are addressing do really need 
the connection to the high-res MIP or to the aerosol MIP or to other MIPs. So this is not only a community question, it is also a scientific question. Third, I think the, um, what the, the scientific challenges which are displayed there, they are um, showing the state of the discussion when we discussed the more scientific challenges for Cordix um, opposite to the data delivery. And the idea was to find topics which are not necessarily directly embedded in one of the other challenges of the grand challenges which are already existing. So what is on the regional scale specifically of interest and for precipitation, this is of course a cross-cutting variable, but there are major questions about how to understand embedded con heavy convection, in, in deep convection heavy precipitation parts, for example. So there, there are specifically regional fine scale features which we were looking for when we came with this uh, list. That's why there, it says local wind system instead of continental scale wind systems. So they bridge, of course, to other WCRP Grand Challenges, and I think this is very important because then we can bridge to the other programs in WCRP. When it came to regional coupling, um, it was not only the ocean ice atmosphere question. There are many discussions. You just discussed land use. You just discussed snow albedo feedback. They are all somehow under the theme of coupling. And the regional coupled modeling was this slot is meant to, to overarch different kinds of coupling activities within the regional modeling community. So it can be coupling different compartments, but it can also be coupling different processes. As you see, we talk about aerosols, atmospheric chemistry, but also about land surface exchange interaction. The feedbacks in this are of major importance for this um, scientific challenge. And the idea was to partly coordinate these activities so that at one point we might end up with something which we have called last time a regional system model. So this is a preparation going into this direction to find out which processes need to be coupled, which probably can, can be researched without coupling. They do not play a role in the coupling. So that's why the coordination term is there, which is not a scientific challenge, the coordination itself, but it should give you the idea that it is more than the individual coupling activities in which expert communities are already existing, and they do a very good job there. So the, in this challenge, there's also embedded the, the question, how do we bring this together where needed and, where, and if it is needed? And that's why the word coordination is there, which I agree should not be there as a scientific challenge. Go. Uh, <clears throat> maybe to, um, to deal with you know, precipitation, because I agree with what was said, we could have a matrix approach. Uh, yeah. uh, so the mountain, urban, yeah. um, basket food, and mm -hmm. coastal, and precipitation, winds, and things like that. Because I think it's probably the best. Well, but that, okay. That's it's what straight. I was thinking when <laughs> talking about these cross cuts. That, that a couple of different ways of thinking about how we organize things, that there'd be things that you might say are know, scientific or modeling challenges, but then there's a regional, a, a specific regional uh, aspect of it that, that talks about pulling it together in terms of a systems view um, through those cross cuts that you suggested before. Um, Yes, my question is, uh, go back, goes back to the basics regarding model optimization. Uh, for the moment, it's a step number zero in the whole process. So basically, we trust that all modeling groups uh, are playing with the sensitivity of the physics option or do the model tuning. 
in order to proceed to the rest hierarchy, like uh, hint cast runs, projection runs. But we have discovered, especially in the MENA regions, we have three publications from three different groups that uh, they have explored the sensitivity on the physics options, and they found differences in the simulated present climate. Also, Philippos group recently explored this with the radiation, I think, with their model. So my question is this, do we need to be, uh, but from the other hand, other groups are just taking the models from the, let's say, mother institutions that they offer the models, and they run it for their region and the different resolutions uh, with the standard, let's say, specifications and physics options. So the question is, is there any concern about uh, what's going out and being published uh, as a result of this? Uh, because we also discovered that if you change the region or the resolution, there are some differences in the best performing combination of physics options. So should there be any coordination or guidelines for this? Or we should leave it freely evolving because they will just add to the diversity in the ensembles of different realizations. That's it. Um, I, I guess that there's a balance that has to be struck between providing too much direction. I mean, you don't want people to go, that's why we have Cordex, to try and have some coordination and have things where people can share their results, but we don't want to be too prescriptive to where you really sort of undermine the whole scientific process. Um, I don't think there's an easy answer to your question. Uh, you don't want, again, you don't want to stop people from doing research. And one of the great things about downscaling, whether it's dynamical or statistical, is that it's, it's more widespread in terms of the number of groups and centers that are doing it. It's not concentrated into these, um, these somewhat limited numbers of, of global modeling centers. So it'll, it's, it's more open in that sense. But it does pose that challenge that uh, some things can get out into the literature that, that are not, maybe not as good as other other groups might have done. You know, the peer review process is supposed to help in that sum, but obviously that's not perfect either. But I, I, my, I, I don't think we want to be too prescriptive in all this. Uh, which I think part of what you're, you're really bringing up is, is we, we need to be thinking about ways of getting our results shared as much as possible. Uh, and with, you know, with the proliferation of all sorts of journals around the world, sometimes it's not easy to keep up with what everybody's doing. Conferences like this help. Um, but that's not the only way, and maybe we should be thinking of other types of forums, maybe, where, where groups can share their results and especially their, their progress in some of these areas. Um, I think there's always that, that challenge in any scientific endeavor. Um, it's something we don't want to overlook, and maybe, maybe trying to think about ways to foster better communication would help. And I'd also say that there's a lot of work that goes on with, with uh, regional downscaling of either any type that could potentially be useful to GCM groups and that communication doesn't go along very well. And in fact, uh, my understanding is from talking with some GCM groups is they have trouble keeping up with, with the literature just of all the people that publish results from GCMs and trying to understand it. So it's almost too much going on sometimes. Um, but we need to think about that further. Uh, here, uh, I'm a uh, little concerned about the uh, sharing of information uh, uh, from the Cordex. It's more generally like scientific plus uh, management issue, but uh, um, when I'm searching somewhere for the data, so sometimes I can't uh, find the baseline data, sometimes I can't find the RCP's data, one is missing, another is missing, so I can't uh, able to find some uh, uniform information that can be used for my publication, especially for the impact studies. Uh, if uh, on-time information of data or sharing of data is very important in this regard, uh, if, if I'm looking for the IPCC report that maybe I submit my publication for the impact studies over there, so it's very difficult for me because I st first I will wait for the output from the cardex and then I will use it for some hydrological model or like that. So if it is on time sharing of data and the, through website or maybe many people take it on personal contacts, but if it is 
uh, open quickly on, uh, after simulation. So it will be more feasible for the uh, interaction and communication, and it will be more worth scientifically in this regard. Uh, Cortex output is supposed to appear on the Earth System Grid Federation, the SGF. Um, some of it is there, a lot of it is not at this point. Um, we, we, we try to get as much of it there as possible, but that, to some extent that depends on what the individual groups do to get it published on the SGF. Um, it takes a lot of effort to get output from typical regional models or statistical downscaling methods into the format that is needed for the ESGF. And, and we really want to make sure that everybody puts it into the same format because then it makes it easier for people to get output from multiple uh, sources and combine them and work with, with multiple models. Um, so uh, there's a slowness there that, that gets in the way of perhaps what you want. Um, I'm not sure what we could do to speed up that process because it does take a lot of effort just to get the output from the the format that the model was developed to produce into the format that we really want for, uh, for Cortex to follow, which is also the same format that is used for CMIP. We, we purposely tried to make sure that the structure was the same as what CMIP is using so that there could be cross comparisons between global and regional modeling as well. So I, I'm not sure, I don't know if, there's, if anybody has any ideas on how to speed up that process, I'd be happy to hear it, but uh, it's an evolving, it's an evolving issue. My hope is that someday models will just routinely turn their out, write out their output in the format that's already ready to go into the SGF, but that's not the case right now. Um, I know it's implicit in some of those issues there, but I would like to see more visibility given to statistical downscaling. I think there's some unique challenge, scientific challenges to statistical downscaling that don't appear there. Um, perhaps some of them are covered under the added value implicitly, um, but the challenges that are there are largely RCM couched, if I can put it that way. Um, and I think given the used nature of statistical downscaling in the applications community, there are some scientific challenges we need to address and should be part of the Cortex. Uh, yes, I mean, part of what Bruce is also getting into is we've recognized that there's a whole other community out there involving statistical downscaling, which was not part of the original formulation of Cortex. Um, and yet that statistical downscaling community in many respects has greater interaction with, with user communities than the dynamical downscaling community does. There's a lot to be learned from each other. And yes, I, I agree with your comment. Somehow that, that these, these were heavily motivated by RCM perspectives and uh, with a little bit of discussion of statistical downscaling as part of it, but it, it, it's, it still has that slant towards RCMs. Um, especially when you talk about regional coupled modeling or something like that. So obviously we want to work further on that. And I, I agree with your comment. Um, Jack, back here. <laughs> um, the one thing that I don't see being projected or discussed here is the, the, it's partly in there, but it's the discussion of how regional high resolution modeling sits into the general uncertainty from the GCM community and the general projections that are come from the GCMs. I mean, I could see there's the added value saying, yes, we can get more detailed, more information on the local scale information, but how does that sit in context of the larger uncertainty due to uh, different scenarios, different GCM, and the r bigger range that you get from the GCMs? I think that's actually a real scientific challenge. We just uh, generated new projections in Australia where we used GCMs. We had statistical downscaling, we had uh, dynamical downscaling involved in that, and it was a real challenge to figure out how to put the downscaled information in the context of the global model uncertainty. And I think that's still a challenge that needs to be addressed because you can still generate really high resolution regional downscale information, but you have to put that in context of the larger uncertainty coming from the uncertainty of the global atmosphere. I think that's a real scientific challenge for us. Uh, yeah, the propagation of uncertainty, how it, yeah, I agree. Um, I mean, one of my concerns with downscaling has always been that I wanted to make sure we weren't simply producing noise with finer detail, which kind of fits in with your comment. Um, yeah, it's, it's a challenge. It's one that we have not, it, it's sort of implicit in that added value, but maybe that's another, another angle on it that needs to be 
brought out more explicitly and explored more explicitly. Um, so, yes. Go ahead. No, it's just uh, we are supposed to end this discussion in three minutes. So yeah. maybe uh, I wanted to make a suggestion for wrapping up somehow. Well, first of all, if there is any purely scientific issue we like this one that we have forgotten, not mentioned, this is your chance to point it out very quickly. Not, not about information, uh, exchanging information, it's just scientific, very... And then we need to wrap up, and I was going to, yeah. to make a proposal. Thank you very much, Filippo. Will from Ufumaoka, IPCC. Just uh, in terms of scientific challenge, I was thinking, uh, reading through your uh, list of items here, I'm not too clear about the time uh, dimension, because I would have thought uh, one of the challenges of the we have the, uh, the regional climate modeling community or downscaling community is the element of seamless prediction. Okay, uh, there Sorry, is now the element? seamless ah. prediction in time. So are we uh, thinking about long term, decadal, uh, something shorter? We need to have something because it sounds very uh, suspicious to people that we are able to provide or produce some added value at long time scale without being able to, for instance, uh, simply downscale seasonal forecasting. And there are a couple of uh, uh, projects over Europe and over Africa whereby RCM do not seem to be producing credible results at seasonal time scale. So my question is, do we need to think about the element of time scale? Or are we targeting long term? Uh, that's the scientific challenge of the, the CODEX community. My own feeling, this is my own personal feeling, is that uh, seasonal to decadal prediction with global models is, still needs to go somewhat further before we can talk about having any value from, for downscaling it, especially on the longer time scales. Uh, as that ability, hopefully, of, of being able to do prediction over, say, a 10, 20 year time frame improves, then maybe there will be some value in doing downscaling. But my sense so far is that the, the accuracy is, is too low to, to think that you're going to get anything beneficial from downscaling those predictions. Um, down the road, maybe that might be possible. But it seems to me, and this is again just my opinion, we're, we're providing regional information from downscaling is, can be most effective is, is when you start going off into farther into the future and you're talking about climate scenarios, um, which is not really in this realm of seamless prediction that I think you're talking about, uh, in part because I'm not sure, quite sure we're there yet, and I think there may always be a, some kind of a divide because the farther you go into the future, the more the human element comes into play. And it's not just pure physical prediction, but it's also trying to make some estimates about what human beings are going to do or not do, and that's a much harder project, prospect. <clears throat> On the other hand, people are starting to look at this. Uh, there are more and more applications to seasonal yeah. prediction, and also now we have a European project that may be looking at decadal predictions, I mean, downscaling decadal predictions. So I see that there is a point in this, in this that we might have some exploratory activities in that regard. In, anyways, so we will note this. Yeah. Uh, there was one last hand, I think, there I saw. Yes, this is last suggestion for some... Uh, no, just, yeah. Yeah. So I was just wondering, with respect to water resources, whether groundwater or the terrestrial hydrosphere should not be explicitly mentioned, you mentioned the food basket regions and water, water yeah, available. Food basket, uh, <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, so the point, in case you couldn't hear it in the back, was whether or not we need to be talking about much more about the terrestrial um, uh, part of the water balanced uh, water cycle. And, and yes, that, that could be, well, in a minor way, that could be added to that, um, to the coupled modeling section. But um, I agree that that, um, that should be, as, as we start trying to encompass more and more of the Earth system, that that's certainly on the longer time scales, especially, um, that comes into play. And, it's, it, and I, I know from some of my own work that it can be, have big, big impacts on, on a, a regional basis. Good point. 
Yeah, anyways, um, let me, if I can, yeah, yeah. Uh, wrap up a little bit. Uh, one uh, thing that I, I liked very much in all this was the suggestion of having this trans... I mean, these topics really look like transversal themes more than anything else, but uh, many of you have pointed more specific topics like mountain environments, coastal environments, uh, seasonal prediction, if you wish, uh, other things. Um, so I think this is a good idea, I think, yeah, to yeah. try to develop more of a grid type of uh, challenge. Uh, no, challenge of challenges, something like that. So maybe this for the... What we will do is, uh, as SAT, I hope uh, I, Irene, or whatever, <laughs> might want to. Um, took good notes of all your suggestions. We will try to develop this type of a grid. Um, and uh, I guess the issue is how do we, uh, what is the process for getting further feedback through the POX, through... I would say partly through the, the points of contact in the region, but we'll also have things on the, on the Cortex website, the we can just send yeah. a blanket email out inviting yeah. people to respond to that. Um, the, the other uh, issue is whether we want to create some type of working groups once we identify, let's say, mountain systems uh, or coastal systems or urban, whatever, whether it may be useful to have uh, sort of working groups with a couple of leaders and, and a group of people that are more interested in that particular issue, still within the Cortex per perspective, not in a general perspective. Uh, would that be overall something that uh, may be useful? Yes, no? Yes, raise your hand. No? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, of course, some then people have to contribute. <laughs> so this is sure. behind the question of whether it's a good no. idea. So we will propose this idea of, well, let's see what this grid will look like. Uh, the working groups will probably be based more on the specific topics, uh, so mountain, yeah. Um, Sorry, just because I question, I don't think it's it's especially made for this kind of very specific... Not okay. Okay. It, it, it could feed we, into that. It, it, it will feed, I mean, it was fed, feeding into the five, but not into the grid. So we will develop this and we'll... Uh, go with the idea of these working groups and you'll hear more from us when we go to the pilot study. Okay, good morning everybody. So we change focus a little bit, but maybe not so much as Dominique was pointing out, much of the parts about the flagship pilot studies relates of course to the scientific challenges. Uh, the idea here is to shortly recapitulate a little bit what this is all about and I uh, will say a couple of words about the procedures and, and how, how you can uh, suggest flagship pilot studies and, and what the re review process is and et, et cetera. And then we can, uh, and then I will also uh, list again the flagship pilot studies that have been proposed and uh, accepted so far. And uh, also say a couple of short words about uh, what will happen now. And then we'll open up for a discussion on, the, on this uh, issue for the time before the coffee break that is in 25 minutes now. So uh, at the last previous Cordex conference, there was also a lot of uh, scientific challenges that were um, uh, identified, and uh, we can have them they are up here very shortly to better assessment of the added value. You can recognize things here now, better understanding of processes rele relevant for regional climate change, uh, broader, more process-based assessment of the downscaling, better integration of Earth system, uh, of uh, empirical statistical downscaling. And uh, then moving towards the convective permitting models, you, you recognize most of these things from what you saw on the previous slides here. The couple, the uh, regional system aspects, including uh, the human dimensions here with urbanization, etc. Uh, and also the effects and impacts of regional forcing f in terms of land use change and aerosols. And uh, yeah, there has been a lot of discussion about the distillation of actionable information. And finally, also better integration of Cordex with other uh, WCRP programs. So these were all of these challenges that were raised at that time, and uh, in, in concert with all of these challenges, there were a set of scientific questions, and I will not list them here since we have just looked into uh, some of them here before. 
Uh, at that point, uh, it was uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, it was um, decided then to to uh, go about to define these so-called flagship pilot studies in where uh, these scientific questions should be addressed. And uh, there has been a process now for how how these could be um, suggested by the community. And uh, there is also a review process for these uh, studies. That uh, and the first launch was in uh, the first submission date was in February this year. So there has been a number of submissions. And I will now quickly just shortly show you what are the criteria for for what uh, how these are evaluated in what way they are evaluated. So. Um, the criteria here, there are four of them, there are two on this slide and two on the next one. So they are, um, the idea here should be that these, these uh, flagship pilots should target finer scale processes and, and uh, clear scientific questions of interest, as it says up here. Uh, when these are evaluated, there are two different sets of, uh, you should, there are some things that should, are really essential for a flagship pilot study to be approved, and there are things that are highly recommended, these are on the, on the right side out there. So we can see here for, uh, for the first uh, criteria then, uh, it's essential then that these, uh, the things that are targeted are not addressed by GCMs or cause a resolution downscaling. So this is now really targeting the really fine scales on really, we can, for instance, talk about the convective permitting, convective permitting models here for, uh, as one thing. Uh, there should be an, uh, it's essential that you should really demonstrate some uh, potential to demonstrate added value of downscaling. And it should also not be addressed with an existing standard framework of uh, Cortex and what we have seen so far with the, say, the 50 kilometer runs, for instance. Uh, and then there are a couple of other things here that are highly recommended, of course, that it can be a useful approach by both dynamical and statistical downscaling is, is one thing here. Uh, so it, that you can compare the two approaches. Uh, it's also that we could investigate regional processes, for instance, like uh, s uh, regional circulations of forcing systems, or, or etc. Et so that was one of the targets, one, one of the criteria. Another one is, uh, uh, and that's highly important here, I think, it's the uh, use of observational data. It's really important to really use the observational data that are, that are available, and this has been, of course, discussed here at the conference as well. Uh, and that's not just the uh, standard meteorological data, but also other derived data, etc. So, uh, highly important here, especially when we go to higher final resolution, is that there is existing uh, observational data uh, that is sufficient for, to support these studies uh, at some region. This is really essential here if you propose a flagship study on, the, on this area. And then I won't read through everything here, but there is more, more things about these observations that I should be able to... Uh, yeah help out them to, to validate the different processes, et cetera. So that's also an important part here. So observations is, a key, is key here, I think. And uh, there are two other things as well. Uh, the, the flagship pilot studies are intended to have some kind of end-to-end -end perspective and the potential then to support some uh, demonstrated local or regional needs. You can look into some specific area and to see what, what are the needs there for, for, some, for, some, uh, for some different aspects. In this case, uh, it's essential really that the impact uh, of the study sh should be from the physical science and or the vulnerability impact assessment uh, and adaptation viewpoints. Um, it's highly recommended also that stakeholder needs are, are, uh, are um, taken into account here in some, to some extent. And, uh, of course, uh, potential to generate funding support is also important since this is al always a key thing here to have these projects really uh, delivering. Finally, there should be an applicant group as well, of course, su suggesting the flagship pilot study. And here it's essential that it's uh, not just one group, so it should really be multiple participants, and this is highly important. So, so it's not just one, one institute suggesting a study, but it should really be integration between different institutes. And it's highly recommended that uh, this takes into account groups from several countries, so it's a pure trans, uh, transnational um, initiative is, is really um, recommended here. So, so this is something to think about when proposing new uh, flagship pilot studies. And also that uh, there is some multidisciplinarity among these different groups. So these are the criteria and the uh, thoughts about what's really essential when, when these are evaluated. And um, if we look a little bit more into the uh, processes then, um, or we start with the ones that have already been selected now, sorry. Uh, so 
all in all, there were nine suggestions, nine submissions of flagship pilot studies in uh, February at the first deadline. And uh, out of these, five have now been selected to be approved at this first stage. Uh, there are four more than that were not approved at the first stage. All of these nine now have, uh, also including the ones that have been approved, will get some feedback or have already gotten some feedback about how they could be improved or modified to even better fit the criteria up here. And this also relates to the other four that have not been uh, approved at this point. So there is an ongoing process now, so they are not completely excluded forever or anything like that. So they, the ones who suggested them, they can modify their, their suggestions and, and come back with a, a revisions or, or a renewed application at a, at a later stage. But if, I, if we just take a quick look here again at the five uh, ones that have been approved so far. Bill showed this slide also on Monday, so you have already seen them. Uh, then we can really see here that there is one for suggested from, from South America on extreme precipitation events. And there is one suggested jointly by the Europe, Europe and the Medcordex domains on convective phenomena. So these two are quite connected, I would say, in terms of, in terms of the focus of, of the study. It's really to look into high-resolution simulations focusing on, on extreme precipitation convection. Uh, there, are three, there are three other ones as well. Uh, one from, the, from Eurocordex here on the impact of land use changes on climate. There is one from the Medcordex here on the role of natural and anthropogenic aerosols. And the third one as well, also again from the Medcordex region, it's on the role of... Um, air-sea coupling and small-scale ocean processes on the regional climate. So in common with, for these three down here is that they are really considering uh, coupled uh, as aspects of the system and, uh, and also the including of the human dim dimension here, as, as we talked about a little bit previously in, the, in this session here, in the previous ses session. So these are the five flagship pilot studies that, are, are, uh, that have been um, approved so far. And uh, as I just, this is my final slide here before we open up for some discussion on this, uh, is that, uh, as I mentioned before, that these flagship pilot studies, they can really be suggested by you from, from the whole community. Uh, there is an intended deadlines a couple of times a year, so every, there are three, three possibilities every year to suggest new flagship pilot studies, and the next one is here in uh, yeah, just a couple of weeks from now, in mid-June. Uh, the idea is to submit these ideas to uh, IPOC. You have the email address here, of course, so then uh, they will be handled, handled by, the, by, by, the, by the office. The assessment of these proposals is being done by the SAT, the Scientific Advisory Team, but uh, they also include here external experts. So they, send, they use other people that also go through these uh, uh, suggestions, looking at the uh, criteria, etc., and, and, and make a judgment of, of what they think about these uh, proposals. And then that gets back to the SAT, and the SAT discusses again and uh, make a formal endorsement of, of, the, uh, SA, of the flagship pilot study if it's deemed to be uh, fulfilling the, the criteria, etc. And then, as I mentioned before, they also then get back with feedback to the proposers if, if there are. No, suggestions for improvements, etc. Uh, finally, what is not uh, written anywhere on any homepage or anything like that right now, this was discussed at, discussed at the SAT meeting on Monday, is that these uh, flagship uh, pilot studies that have been approved, it is ex expected, of course, that they should, to some extent, report back to the community uh, what they are up to, and to, so that everyone else can see what is the progress and what, what can we learn from, from this exercise. So... Uh, as written here, it's expected that there will be some kind of reporting back from these, at least once a year. And uh, importantly, this, these reports, they will be highlighted also on the Cordex uh, homepages so that everyone can go in and, and look into it and see what, what is happening in, uh, in for, for instance, in the South American flagship pilot study or the, or the Medcordex one on the uh, oceans, so, etc. So, so the other ones not directly involved can learn from, from what the other groups are, are um, um, uh, our finding in their studies. So this is basically what I wanted to show you just now. So this was a short recap recapitulation of what these flagship pilot studies are and a little bit of uh, which are the ones that have been selected so far. So at this point, I think I would like to open up here now for, for comments on, on, on the flagship pilot studies, on the content of, of, of uh, 
these, maybe not the specific five ones that have been selected, but also, and importantly here, I think it's important really to discuss the processes here so that the SAT and the Cortex community can go on and, and uh, think about how to expand this to maybe possibly more regions and encourage others to uh, submit studies also from the other regions, etc. So I would like to open up and uh, invite comments and, uh, from the floor now. And we have some one from the front here. So please. Um, yeah, good morning. Diana Rechert from the Climate Service Center. Um, I have, is it, is it on? Um, um, at first, um, thank you for, so I have two questions. At first, thank you for launching this FPS um, initiative. I think it's a good um, initiative to address the scientific challenges. So um, we proposed um, this land use change um, 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 FPS and within Eurocortex, but I think this is an initiative that could also be transferred then later to other Cortex regions. So, and this is a good thing then to exchange what is the uh, progress and at a certain point we can also contact um, the other um, coordinators of, the, of these regions. But I have um, one question. So this is a large organizational effort. Would there be any possibility to give some support for organizing meetings, workshops? So for example, could there be a biannual meeting for the FPS uh, or something like that? Okay, that's a, that's a good question, and you, I have no answer to that one. I've not really thought about that. I don't know if anyone else has, but of course, in, in terms of a, yeah, some, kind of, some kind of support for that would be, it, it would be nice if we could find, find that somehow, but how that should be organized, I really don't know. But I think, first of all, it should be something that is, is, uh, take, is being taken care of within the applicant group, since they are the ones responsible for it. But then, of course, I think that the... IPOC here and also uh, the SAT to some extent should be at least informed about that and, and then we can see what we can do. But um, I have no, um, I cannot make any promises or anything. But maybe Bill has a comment here. Is it on? Is to try to determine possible funding sources. Um, and this would be, so if we have certain goals in mind for what we might like to fund, this could be one of them uh, that we keep in mind. The WCRP leadership always emphasizes to us that they don't have a lot of money themselves to give out. But if we have targeted areas that we're looking at, that might open up the possibility for certain types of proposals that could lead to that. We would probably have to work together with the, 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 the flagship pilot study people to see if we can pull something together. Um, and the second question. Yes. So the FPS are good to address the scientific questions. The Cortex frame we will discuss later, um, they are a very, will provide a very valuable database for either climate services, but also the scientific um, exercises. But uh, I think there is one important part missing, this distillation topic. And I'm wondering if it would make sense maybe to establish a third initiative on the same level um, which deals deriving information, products from um, the, this database, also from the scientific uh, flagships, if this would be a possibility. Okay, I think I will leave this, this one for the uh, Codex chair, co-chairs here to, to dwell on that. But I also have a comment on that. In addition to that, it's not just the data part, it's also the uh, um, capacity building part about uh, yeah, help with scientific training and training in other, other forms that could also come into that context. Yeah. No. You should speak for some time. It's on here. Yeah, now it's on. I can okay. Uh, concerning the funding, uh, WCRP has, doesn't have much money, we know that. But they do fund workshops. For example, they fund workshops under Clivar and their Click or whatever. So I think that there is the possibility to ask WCRP for some funding. And if you are an FPS, I think you have a higher chance. So the advantage of being an FPS is to show that there is a, an activity actually going on that is trying to address some questions that are relevant to Cordex ergo relevant to WCRP. 
right? <laughs> so this doesn't mean that WRCP will fund it, but I know that, for example, at ICTP, WCRP is funding one workshop every year, at least for the last few years. Uh, I funded one on decadal predictions, one on other issues. Uh, so, for example, one on land use could very well be a proposal. So, <clears throat> in some ways, being an FPS will help in this process. Uh, concerning the other issue, this is actually a very hard issue. I, to be honest, anything that has to do from climate on, I personally feel should not be part of Cordex. The distillation is really something that Bruce will do in the foresight projects or some, I mean, the climate services will do. Um, I'm not sure to what extent, uh, I mean, as long as it's a scientific issue of uncertainties or something like that is fine. But uh, uh, going then the next step to actually provide the information, have the information ready for users or something like that, I think, I feel personally that's a bit beyond uh, what Cordex want, wants to do, and that's probably to be done by other bodies. I don't know if Bill feels the same. But. Yeah, no, no, I, no, I agree. Yeah. Okay, so there is a question from yeah. Douglas. No, well, it's more a comment um, regarding distillation. We had a side event on distillation yesterday evening, and um, we're discussing and I think also agreeing that um, distillation is, as Philip would have said, much, much broader than just Cordex. So if we do something specific within Cordex, we have to be very, very careful that our view and approach is not much too narrow. So I think we shouldn't be just prematurely saying that, well, it's something which Cordex now focuses yeah. on. Okay, Andreas. Um, we had a discussion in our convection permitting site meeting. Um, I think it's great that the Euro Cordex and Met Cordex joined in this convection flagship pilot study, but of course you can do this in most of the um, cortex domains. So on the one hand side, you could have a lot of flagship pilot studies, which are very similar, or you can really try to bring them under one umbrella, which would make a lot of sense, I guess, if they have the same topic. Like I think the South American one is related, closely related. Did you think about this as well? Yeah, this is why I mentioned them in the, at the same time here, since I see also that they really have a, some commonalities, as you're mentioning, so that yeah. uh, it, could be, it could be a, a good idea uh, to, to one extent. The other part of it is, of, is, of course, the more administration part of it, uh, as was mentioned here. I mean, to bring together people from maybe if you have flagship pilot studies all over the world working with the same idea. It's, for, it's of course great to get everyone together to work on the same <laughs> thing, but it's all more difficult to get uh, kind of funding for that uh, workshop or whatever. So, uh, so there are two, two aspects of it, I guess. Yeah, <clears throat> let me comment on this. Um, okay, the idea of the flagship study, at least my idea, is that really they should be flagship. This means that I don't see 50 flagship studies. Okay, now, this five that have been uh, accepted, actually, even a bit beyond what I was, I mean, I was actually hoping that we would have, because really this have to be, the idea of these studies have to be groundbreaking uh, studies. So the hope is not that people just repeat the same exercise in all different domains or whatever. In fact, uh, some of the um, weaknesses of the ones that were not accept, approved were that they were just kind of repeating something already done, but to be, you're going to do it here. So before somebody submits a flagship uh, that on convection permitting somewhere uh, that does the same that you're doing in Europe or whatever, I think it would be nice to coordinate with you guys. It's a message not with, to, to, to the Europeans, but to the others maybe. Uh, to see to the extent to which you can maybe join and broaden a little bit the uh, study. Of course, can, there cannot be 300 participants, otherwise it becomes unmanageable. On the other hand, uh, if the focus is distinctly different, uh, for example, you, you focus on uh, MCS or something in Africa or whatever, 
that is very different from Europe, it doesn't make sense to join the two. So it really depends on. But don't submit 300,000 flagship studies because then the concept is lost. Okay, so we, we are fi finishing in, a, in just a few minutes. So I'll have a short comment from, from Bruce up so there, and then we have one more comment from there. So then but you have one for me before. I'm so I sorry. So you also sorry. have the mic. Ah, <laughs> oh, it's you who had the mic. Sorry. Daniela, so, no please problem. go ahead. So, um, I think when, when we now um, follow the discussion, I think it's very important that the activities which are done inside of Cordex are very transparent. So I think we, we have to find a way that what will be done in a flagship pilot study is visible and transparent to all those who are not in the flagship pilot study, or which, what will be done in one of those working groups or FOSI, or I don't know what, I mean, FOSI is not Cortex, as I understood, which is good. So I think um, we have to discuss a little bit the, uh, the, the transparency and the, uh, the exchange of information between domains and activities. And I think there we, uh, we probably can pick it up uh, this afternoon in the SAT, but I think that could help to uh, also bring in, uh, let's say in the convection case, bring in expertise from those who are currently not in, in, in this uh, activity of the flagship pilot study, but those are not closed activities. They should be open and they should be um, efficient, which is uh, not so easy to fulfill both of these. Okay, thank you, Daniela. I think that's a very good comment. So it's very, very important that we have information on the, on the Cortex web pages, highlighting all of this, the progress in, in all of the different yeah, groups, etc. One comment here. I, I just wanted uh, to bring an information about this Euromed uh, on convection permitting. Uh, it, it's not just a convection permitting uh, project. Uh, it built on also field experiments that were carried in the uh, region of investigation from the HIMAX. So, so regarding all the criteria that were, there, it's much more than just a, a modeling exercise. There are many data, but also uh, I would say end users, so impacts. So everything is identified and goes just beyond just a modeling exercise. So that's why uh, well, it's not just a convicted uh, that could be, you know, reproduced as you say, so you have uh, like thousands of... Uh... Okay, thank you, that's very good, and that, that is what we will learn more, more from also when we have these reports and information on the, on the homepage is describing these flagship policy studies more. I think we have a final comment from, from Bruce up there, and then we are going to coffee. I just wanted to make a comment on this tension about where the boundary of Cortex actually exists, and caution that a, a too hard a boundary gets put in place. I note that from the criteria of the FPS, one of the criteria are design end-to-end, climate-to-end user projects demonstrating actionable value that already steps over the core physical climate science boundary. And my recommendation is that the Cortex SAT strongly um, consider how a component of Cortex engages in that interface. That doesn't mean everybody in Cortex needs to do it. But I would be averse to seeing a very hard boundary on Cortex of this is only physical climate science and not engaging in that interface. Uh, yeah, and I, 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 I don't disagree with you. I think maybe one way that we might approach that is if we start having, thinking more about these cross-cut areas that center on particular physical, geographical characteristics like complex topography or coastal areas that might, where, where more of a systems view is taken, that might actually feed more directly into making sure that appropriate information is, is developed. I agree the boundary should be fuzzy. Uh, and there probably will always be a tension going back and forth in terms of the, how far Cortex goes or doesn't go. But, but it's got to be, it certainly has to be an open boundary. Okay, yeah. so uh, one minute comment from Philip and then comment. we go to coffee. We, we can go a couple of minutes yeah. over. Because um, <laughs> he, he has to talk. <laughs> no, no. No, if, if somebody else has questions, I don't want to cut the questions because we lose five minutes of coffee. Um, about this, the issue is, I mean, one of the purposes of FPS is indeed that you can demonstrate the usefulness of Cordex for the VI application. So I didn't mean to say that we shouldn't go into the application. What I meant to say is that Cordex does not have to be confused with the climate service uh, institution. So as long as there is a scientific issue that is how we distill information, is this valuable, 
and this will include the interaction with stakeholders, that is perfectly within the boundaries. If we start saying, oh, but people ask Cordex data to apply to, I don't know, build a dam in London, then it's not Cordex anymore. That's a climate service type of thing. They, this is what I meant. So definitely Cordex includes the application component. That's why we have this. In fact, it would be very nice to have one flagship study that demonstrates that we produce information that can be used. So if, if there is other questions, I think we can go a couple of minutes overboard. I guess people prefer coffee. Okay.